We're going to start tonight with prayer. We're going to sing a little bit more in just a minute. We're going to pray a little bit more in just a minute. We're having revival, and we're praying for revival. So you may be seated for just a moment. I've asked my friend Ron Gallagher, who um, first thing this morning, for me, that's like 730. That's first thing this morning. Uh, we were praying together at King's Corner, 
and um, we got a table together. And uh, Ron is from the Virginia Family Foundation. A lot of the stuff that Scott was yiping about this week, but he's going to leave town. He's going to fly and go home tonight or tomorrow. The Virginia Family Foundation, they're doing it day in, day out. We support them financially. We support them with prayer. We want to see our country come back to God. In a minute, we're going to pray for our leaders. Or we're going to pray for our church specifically. But before we have a little more worship, we're going to pray. Come on up, Ron. He's going to pray, and then we're going to do a little bit more worship. So, Ron, please come and just pray for our country, our city, for God to bring revival to our land. Thank you, Pastor Pat. Let's pray together. Father, my um, mind is gone in this time of prayer. And I think about the great needs that are here in this community that we live around every day. We live against a tsunami of evil. And I remember the account you gave of Jonah. And one of the things you bothered to tell us, Lord, about this man, who was a, a prophet, but he wasn't acting like a prophet. He was called, but he wasn't acting like he was called. He was sent, but he didn't go where he was sent. And when he woke up, there was a horrible storm that descended on that boat. And it was Jonah's fault. He was the reason for it. But he was also the solution for it. And the solution to the storm that threatened everybody was him. And it occurs to me tonight, Father, that there's nobody more dangerous to the communities we live in than Christians out of fellowship with you. There's nothing that's going to bring more storms and problems and fears and awful things on a people than your people out of fellowship with you, going in the wrong direction with a mission they don't fulfill, a calling they don't recognize, and being sent where they won't go. And God, these people around us are suffering. There's more pain and loss and grief and problems and tears and blood than I've ever seen in this country. And it's because I think of your people. We're the hope, but we're also the problem. And I pray tonight that every one of us would have our heart open to you. We didn't come here to hear this man preach. We came to hear what you have to say to us individually. And I pray, Father, that your movement will be powerful. I've seen him sitting over there, and he doesn't look too powerful, but you are. And his words might not be too powerful, but you are. And we're here to open our heart to you, for you to do what you did so many times in our history. And we are called, every one of us who know you, have been called to you, cleansed, equipped, and then been sent. But some of us aren't, act, we're not acting like prophets. We're not acting like called and sent people. So please, Father, correct us tonight. Instruct us tonight. Cleanse us tonight. Redeem us tonight and the rest of our lives that we might be an impact in this, in this community for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing because we have more than enough reason to worship our God. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be blessed with our worship, God, that you would be blessed, God, by the praise that we give you, Father. You're holy and you're worthy. Your name is great and your heart is 
to you and to you alone be all glory and honor and praise. Father, you are great and mighty and powerful. And Father, we give you thanks and glory. And it's in you that we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Be seated. Listen, folks, we're going to do something now. Um, actually, Scott, I had a mini sermon prepared. I'm serious. A little sticky note. But I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to share a little bit of it. Because I want to cut into your time. We're, we're going to pray right now. And we pray for revival around our country, around our city. We're going to pray for revival to take root. I believe revival has happened this summer in this, these meetings these last few days. But we're going to pray for life change at Kingsland Baptist Church. And uh, to do that, I'm going to get someone that doesn't go to Kingsland Baptist Church to pray for us in just a minute. And uh, so leaders, listen, leaders, if you're a leader, in just a moment I'm going to call you forward. And uh, we're going to pray for you. So be ready for that. Um, how will we know that revival took place? I mean, really, is there a magic wand? Is there some, you know, what does revival look like? I thought a lot about that. One year ago, those, uh, tomorrow will be the one-year anniversary of those attacks in Benghazi. Twelve years ago tomorrow, our nation was attacked on September 11, 2001, and we were humbled. And we humbled, the nation humbled itself, even for just a moment, and cried out for God's help. Unfortunately, that did not turn into national or worldwide revival, did it? But we had a little taste of that. In fact, I remember that night, Pastor Pete. <laughs> we were here, and, we, and we, we did all we knew to do, which was to get together and cry out to God for help, to save us and spare us, and, and to, 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 to take something that was horrible and turn it into something, turn it into something good. And you know, that we're here 12 years later, thank God. Our country's still around, we're still around. A lot has changed. Unfortunately, things haven't gotten better and better. It seems to me they keep getting worse. And we're praying for a revival in our land. But really, that revival has to start with me. It starts with you, and it starts with us. And I thought about what, what does revival look like in a, in a culture, in a church, in a culture? Repentance, national repentance, seeking after God, reverence toward God. And let's just face it, people getting saved. That's what our country needs, to get saved. But then you look at our church, and there's so much I could say about that. You know, what does revival look like? Well, revival might look in your life like you just crack open that dusty black book that sits on your, on your um, coffee table that doesn't get opened up very often. And you read it, and you apply it to your life. And you, and you, and you turn off all the technology, all the televisions and computers. And, and revival for you might just be spending a little time with Jesus. But here's the trick. Having a big high and a big, and we've had it. I mean, it's been awesome. Scott, thank you. I, I really appreciate you. And I believe the Lord, as has been prayed for, the Lord has intervened and done awesome things in our presence. And, and yet, what about next week, next month, next year? I think revival for a lot of you is just getting up tomorrow morning and reading your Bible and spending some time with Jesus. Revival for a lot of people in our church. Do you know how many hundreds and hundreds of people go to this church? And there's a lot of people here to go to other churches tonight. Thank you for being... Some of you are just here for the first time. You might not even have a church. Thank you for being with us tonight. You, you're part of our church tonight. But you know, revival really at Kingsland would be a whole lot of people, church members. Here it is. And, and, and look, I don't want to offend anybody, but let's just, let's just be straightforward. Lazy, apathetic, worldly church members getting right with God, falling in love with Jesus, repenting, and getting back in church, participating, coming, attending, giving, tithing, serving faithfully. We'll know that revival took place on Sunday, in the next Sunday, in the one after that. Pastor Derek's preaching in two Sundays. I told him, preach on revival. I don't know what I'm preaching about this Sunday, but I bet it's going to be something about revival. I just have a hunch. And, and we're not going to let this thing go. We want to see God change our church. We want to see God grow our church. We want to see God grow the kingdom. We're praying for Bermuda. Worship Collective, thank you. Most of them go to Bermuda. Sean, Pastor Sean Hypes. Did you know Pastor Sean, how he got ordained? I was there. It happened. He's ordained. He's a pastor. And, and Josh and Brandon, thank you so much for being with us and leading us in worship. Uh, are y'all done? Y'all you, going to do another song in a second, aren't you, when we're done praying? You got one more? No? Where'd Sean go? Is that it? We're done. Okay. We can hum. We can whistle. We can do something. Um, 
Now, let's pray. And we're doing things a little bit different tonight because, look, if, just, if we just get together and have another meeting, man, who needs that? Great crowd. Thank you for being here, all of you. Thank you for being here. Let's pray that God pours himself out on our church. Let's pray that God pours himself out on our lives, on the church north of us, south of us. Uh, Brother Ron is a, is a very involved member at Grove Avenue. Pastor Pete from Bermuda is here, and I've asked him to come. We're praying for Bermuda. We're praying for Grove. I love Mark Beckton. Uh, look, we're praying for the church in our community to experience revival, and we're, we're praying for us to do our part. So here it is. This is a little awkward. I didn't warn anybody about this. Please, by all means, don't let me, don't let me, you know, I'm not here to mess up your night too much, but heaven forbid we just come here and just go through the motions and go through another night. And quite frankly, if all we do is listen to that man talk tonight, that's not enough. We talked last night about being spirit-led, being spirit-led as a church, being spirit-led as individuals. He's going to finish that tonight. I can't wait to hear him talk. Don't get me wrong. But I want the Holy Spirit to talk, and I want God to move, and I want it to start with our leaders. What's a leader? A deacon, an usher, a Sunday school teacher, an Awana worker, any worker of any kind. If you have a ministry at Kingsland, I'm asking you right now to avail yourself of this moment. I've asked Pastor Pete to pray for you. I've asked Scott to come and lay hands on you. I'm going to do that too. And um, we're going to pray and then Sean lead us in one more worship song and then Scott Smith is going to come and preach. So that's the agenda. That's where we're going. Leaders from Kingsland. Now you may be a leader in another church. God bless you. I want you to pray for the people here. We need it. And thank all of you for being here. But this, this little moment right here is for our leaders our servants, our, 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 and thank you for leading. Thank you for serving. I love you, and I appreciate you. This church would be, would just wouldn't even exist if it weren't for your sacrifices that you make. And some of you are leaders that need to be leaders. You know, we, have, we have leadership training at the end of the month. Last, thing, la last little admonition I'll give you. If you want to worship, let's worship. We'll be back on Sunday worshiping. If you want to serve, Man, get involved in something and serve, and, and we'll, and you say, well, I don't know how. We will train you. The end of the month, Saturday and Sunday, September 28th and 29th, we have E412 training here locally up at Staples Mill, and we'll be back on Sunday doing leadership training right here. You, you want to get discipled and grow closer to Christ? Be back tomorrow when all the lights and bells and whistles and guitars and fun is going to be, it's not going to be here, but we're going to be, but we're going to be studying the book of James, men. Ladies, you're going to be studying the book of Revelation, and your kids are going to be growing and memorizing verses of the Bible at Awana. And, and you want to, teenage, you want to win your friends to Christ? Bring them with you to, to Collision tomorrow night. It's going to be great. So let's do something with this revival. Let's, let's move on it. Let's get involved. Let's act. And uh, leaders, would you stand and come forward and huddle across the stage here? Pastor Pete, if you would come, take your time, pray. It looks like you got a scripture for us. Leaders, make your way forward. No pushing or shoving. And um, Pastor Pete. Pray for us. Thank you, Brother Pat. As everyone is coming, I want you to hear what God said when he was having a conversation with Solomon. Second Chronicles 7, 14 through 16 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So as we, as we pray for the leaders in this local body, I just want us to, I just want us to know how much God wants to meet with us and wants to and wants to have relationship with us. So let's um let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear most precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, I want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, for all that you have done to make a way for us. Lord, thank you for the church. Thank you for your love for the church. Thank you that the church is strong in your name. And Lord, as I look at these leaders here at Kingsland Baptist Church, each one with a 
particular gift, each one with so many different things that you have equipped them with to lead in the way that you have them leading. Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged. Lord, I pray that they would be strengthened. Lord, I pray that they would hunger after your word. Lord, I pray for a filling of the Holy Spirit. I pray that they would be filled to overflowing with your spirit. And that everything they do would be spirit-led. That everything they say would be spirit-led. Lord, that you would do in their life what only you can do. Lord, that you would use them to pour into the lives of others. And Lord, for those that aren't up here, Father, I pray that they would find their place, their place of service. Lord, this is a group of servants up here. This is a group of people that have simply said, yes, Lord, I will do whatever you have for me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Lord, that your name would be lifted up, that you would be glorified, that you would be made known through each and every one of us. Lord, you bless us in so many ways. Lord, I, I take this moment to lift up my dear brother, Carl Wilson, laying in a hospital bed right now, clinging to life. And Lord, I just pray for him in a special way. I pray that you would touch him in a special way. Lord, there are so many others that need a touch from you. But Lord, again, may we be the church. Lord, may we live as you have called us to live. Lord, may we be set apart. May we be different. May we talk differently. May we walk differently. Lord, truly that revival would come in my heart, in our hearts, and Lord, that a spiritual awakening would happen in this land like we've never seen before. Lord, you gave me the privilege of, of seeing you unleash in Africa. Lord, I pray that you would unleash in America. I pray for a hunger for your word. I pray that people would turn back to you. And I pray that we, the church, we, your people, would stand strong, would stand in the gap, would speak truth, and would live it each and every day. So Lord, take these leaders, revive them, re-energize them, give them all that they need. Lord, you are all that we need. And Lord, you can do things through us that we can't even imagine. You took 12 ordinary men and you did extraordinary things through them and yes Lord we know that one of them fell one of them failed but Lord I pray I pray that you would simply lead us guide us and Lord that we would place all of our trust in you we love you we honor you we praise you in your most precious and holy name and all God's people said Amen. Let's stand and sing together. God, may whatever goes on in our lives, Lord, in good times and in bad, Father, when you give and take away, may we fix our eyes on you, Father. May you be our vision, God are everything.
Riches I heed not, riches I heed not, and no man's empty praise, thou mine inheritance now and always, thou and thou but first in my heart High King of heaven My treasure thou art No God be my everything Be my delight Be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. No God be my everything, be my delight. Be Jesus, my glory, my soul satisfied. My Jesus, no, you satisfy my Jesus, you said you satisfy yeah. High King of Heaven. Much victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be fall, still be my victory. Oh, ruler of all, no God be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. No God be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. No God be my everything, be my be Jesus my glory, oh, my soul satisfied, and oh God be our everything, be our delight, be Jesus our glory, our soul satisfied. 
Father, we thank you, God, that we can look to you. God, and we can serve you and follow after you and know that your ways are good. God, I pray that you would revive our hearts. God, you would revive our souls, awaken us, God, to your purpose, and to your kingdom, and to who we are supposed to be in you. So, Father, we thank you and ask, God, that you would speak. Holy Spirit, speak. We give you praise. It's your name we pray. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> could we sit where we are and let's bow our heads. I want you to make an altar of right where you sit. I believe the Lord has uh, clearly already begun to speak to our hearts tonight <clears throat> through through the music, through the worship, through your pastor. So would you, would you offer up a prayer to the Lord like something like this tonight? In your heart of hearts, would you just say to him, Lord, tonight, help me to see about me what you want me to see. And whatever you reveal about me to me, may I see it the way you see it. May I share the same opinion about those things in my life, good or bad or indifferent, that you share. And then would you say to him something like this, Lord, help me to see you. Help me see about you what you want me to see about you. Help me to know about you what you want me to know about you. Reveal to me those attributes, those characteristics, those aspects of your character and your heart that you want me to see and know and live in light of. Help me to see about you what you want me to see about you. And Father God, with open hearts and minds, we come before you. And I thank you for those of us in this room, Lord, who have experienced redemption. We've experienced salvation. We've experienced the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we were in the mud and mire, that you lifted us up and set our feet on a firm rock. We thank you that when we were running away from you, that you chased us in love. We thank you that you put a new song in our mouth and a hymn of praise in our heart and that you've called us to testify of you in such a way that many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And you are indeed the Lord. You are the hope of our nation, the hope of our generation. And we thank you, Lord, that we've been graced with some revelation, some understanding of you, of the gospel, so that we might be able to share it with others who are as much in need as we who are as much in need as we were. We love you, we praise you, and we anticipate great things tonight and in the days and years to come. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, if you're saved tonight, say, I am. If you, if you love Jesus, say, I do. If you're glad you came to church, say, I am. Let's give Jesus a praise tonight. Aren't you glad you came to church? Amen. Galatians chapter 5, get there with me, Galatians chapter 5. You know, so much has been said already tonight, and this is a great burden of my own as well. It's the state of our nation. And, uh, and I'm not going to preach on that tonight, but I tell you, so much of what I'm preaching on last night and finishing this passage tonight, we didn't finish it last night, we're going to finish it tonight, is really the great need of the hour. I mean, and, and we are in desperate days in America. But I, but I hope we understand that a lot of the things that are plaguing our hearts and minds about the state of our nation and the state of our culture, we are merely reaping now the seeds that were literally sown as far back as the 1960s. I mean, what we're reaping right now is not the result of the last few years. It is the result of decades of decadence. And so what's, what's, what's a stark and heavy reality to me is 
that if there is no change in our culture, I don't believe that we can fully fathom the seeds that we are sowing right now for generations to come. If the seeds that were sown in the 60s and 70s have gotten us to where we are now, then what could be coming of our nation in the next 40 years based on what we sow now? We looked at it last night. A man reaps what he sows. Here's the law. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. But you reap what you sow. And to sow to the flesh, and our nation is riddled with the flesh, is to reap corruption. But to sow to the Spirit is to reap everlasting life. I tell you, what we need in America is not a change in the White House. We need a change in the church house. If we ever have revival, it'll not be from the top down. It'll be from the bottom up. It's amazing how believers, it's so easy for us as believers to blame the government so we don't have to look inward. So we don't have to come to grips with the reality that our brother prayed tonight as he prayed and said, you know, we're not just the cure, we also the cause until we're the cure. If we have anybody to blame, it's not. Listen, folks, if you're waiting on politics to bring revival, you're going to be waiting on a long time. Do you know where the word politics comes from? It comes from two words, poly, which is the Latin word many, and ticks, which is the southern word bloodsucker. <laughs> I mean, put it together. See, see, what America needs is not a change of regimes, not a change of administrations, because whether it's Republican, Democrat, Polecat, doesn't matter. It's all the same stuff. They all need Jesus. The fact of the matter is, what America needs is a change of hearts, and the only thing that will change hearts is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, both of you. God bless you. That is absolutely the truth. I'm telling you, the only thing that can change hearts is not legislation, and programmation, or medication. It's only Jesus, and that's what we need. The great need of the hour is a group of people that are hopelessly, helplessly in love with Jesus. And the way that we display that is we're saying, God, be thou my vision. My vision is not what the government says. My vision is not what my parents handed down. My vision is not the best I can see or what is right in my own eyes. My vision is you. God is like the sun. It's not that we just can't see without it, but with it we see everything. The great need of the hour is not better sermons. The best sermons to ever come out of any country or culture came out of England. If preaching would save a country, it would have saved England. If you go to England today, their churches are empty because God never rested his agenda on what preachers did. Never. Preaching is important. It's proclamation of the gospel. Indeed, that matters. But I'm telling you, God's agenda rests on God's own people one by one going out full of the Spirit of God and empty of self, and that's the only hope of change. So what is he looking for? He's looking for a people who will identify what the flesh is and not rename the flesh and not make it politically correct and not rationalize the flesh, but call it what it is. Not put it in a different category, not make it big and small and, man, we don't do the big stuff, but everybody's got small stuff. I mean, get past those mental gymnastics that we do, trying to keep flesh in our lives and repent of those things and walk not in the flesh by walking in the Spirit. And so the first thing that we said last night is, if, you're, if you and I are going to decide to walk in the Spirit or walk by the Spirit, the first thing we have to understand is the first thing Paul pointed out in this text, and that is that the Spirit is opposed by the flesh. Last night we read this, but I say then walk in the Spirit. You'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You know, we broke these down in detail. Now, the words of the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, purity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of wrath, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, org orgies, and the like. And, and we broke down those in, in a way that we, we, we couldn't say, you know, don't, don't rename these things. Don't, don't rationalize these things. They are what they are. As a matter of fact, chapter 6, skip over there, look there. Chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For one who sows to his flesh will of flesh reap corruption. One who sows to the Spirit will, eat, will reap of everlasting life. The Spirit is opposed by 
the flesh. So, so we don't end the revival saying, I'm going to stop this, stop this, stop that, stop this, stop that, stop that, stop that. And most preachers would be happy if we just go out of here com committing to do that. But that's not how God rigged it. He didn't say, stop walking in the flesh. He said, start walking in the Spirit. The way I stop walking in the flesh is not by focusing on stopping walking in the flesh. The way I stop walking in the flesh is by giving my heart, my attention, my focus to walking in the Spirit. So the Spirit is opposed by the flesh, number one. Number two, so you say, all right, preacher, I, I want to walk in the Spirit. So how do I know if I am doing that? I mean, what am I supposed to look for if, if I'm walking in the Spirit? What's going to show up in my life to affirm to me that I am walking in the Spirit, heading the right direction? Well, go back to Galatians 5, and I want you to pick up with me in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit. So number one, last night is this. The Spirit is opposed by the flesh. Here's number two. You ready? Write it down. Number two, the Spirit is characterized by fruit. Say that with me. Characterized by fruit. One more time characterized by fruit. In other words, listen, everything that is gives evidence that it is what it is. You don't have to guess it is what it is. You know what it is by the evidence that it has. See, kind of like, kind of like uh, this uh, second grade teacher was doing show and tell. She said, tomorrow's religion day. And so we're, for show and tell, we're going we're gonna to bring, I want you to bring a symbol of your religion. And so the next day, the kids come in, and they got all kinds of stuff they brought with them. The first kid stands up, and he says, Hi, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic. This is a crucifix. And the next kid says, I, I'm Jewish. This is a star of David. And the next kid said, I'm Baptist. This is a casserole. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> how true, how true. Amen. Amen. Come on now. So, so, so the Spirit steps on the scene. He says, I'm the Spirit. Well, how do you know I'm the Spirit? Here's my fruit. Now, listen. Here's my fruit. Look at my fruit, the Spirit says. Listen, the evidence that the Spirit of God is working and dominant in a person's life is fruit, not gifts. Not gifts. Fruit. Now, why do you stop there, preacher, and say that? Here's why I say that. Because there are entire denominations that have been built around the idea that the evidence of the Spirit's work in a person's life are gifts. And that's not what the Scripture teaches. Now, there are spiritual gifts, and God gives gifts to men. And if you're saved, you have a spiritual gift. I'm not saying that at all, that that's not true. That is true. But the sign that the Spirit is at work in your life, you're not to look for the gifts. You're to look for the fruit. You're to look for the fruit. Look. Here, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, you'll know them by their... We are very participatory tonight. <laughs> Y'all need to stop at Starbucks on the way here, I think. You'll know them by their... You'll know them by their... Jesus said, you'll know them by their... Well, we're not supposed to judge. Jesus said, judge not. Yeah, but he did say we could be fruit inspectors. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that right? You'll know the tree by the fruit. And the way you know the tree by the fruit is not the root, but by the fruit. And so God, Jesus said, look for the fruit. Listen, not look for the gifts. Why is that important? Here's why. Because God says something entirely different about gifts. You can have gifts of the Spirit and be functioning in gifts of the Spirit and not be full of the Spirit. You know what the Bible says about gifts? Here's what the Bible says about gifts. The Bible says God distributes gifts among men as He wills, as His Holy Spirit wills. He gives gifts determined. Now, you, I don't know what gift you got, but you got a gift. You may have the gift of hospitality. You may have the gift of administration. You may have the gift of leadership. You may have the gift of preaching. I don't know what you have, gift of evangelism. There are a lot of different kind of gifts, and some of them are manifestational gifts, and some of them are resident gifts, and there's all these kind of gifts. But here's, here's the bottom line. He gives gifts as he wills, and the Bible says as he gives that, he doesn't take it back. He's not an Indian giver. He doesn't give it if you walk in the Spirit, and then you're not walking in the Spirit. He takes the gift back. He doesn't do that. He's not what we call an Indian giver. Remember, granddaddy used to call him Indian givers. You want to give it, take it right back. No, not at all. You, you, he doesn't do that. Now, here's what we say. We say, you better use the gift God gave you. If you don't use it, he'll take it away. The only problem with that is it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Listen, man, listen. You, you can have, let's say you have the gift of preaching. 
all right? And God uses your preaching and your communication, your ability to, to preach and proclaim truth, to make it clear, and to draw people to Christ, all right? And I'm using that because this is one of the big, the big ones. And so, um, uh, as far as the one that we, we miss. And so, he's functioning in that gift. It, it is possible to him to be functioning in that gift at a level 10, but walking in the Spirit at a level 2 or worse. See, we are shocked, we are surprised when we read in the newspaper about some evangelist that was growing a big church down in some state way away from here, and he had a big television ministry, and 500 people were getting saved every night, and then we're shocked, we're surprised when we find out that the whole time the church was going and people were getting saved, he was soliciting prostitutes on the back alley somewhere. Does that happen? Yes, it does. Why? Here's why. Because once God gave that man a gift, God doesn't take it back. So he can be functioning in the gift, yet be backslidden on God. Because the gift is permanent. The gift is resident. Understand, that is why God says, look, you'll know them by their fruit, not gifts. Don't look for gifts. Look for fruit. Amen. Here's our problem. We are seduced by gifts, and we don't look for fruit. We do. Listen, you can get two guys to stand up and deliver the Word of God. One does it, and he rants and raves and spits and hollers, and we walk out thinking, man, that guy was anointed. One guy gets up full of God, but he barely speaks above a whisper, and God uses him mightily, but we say, yeah, he's okay. And our entire sign of whether or not he's full of the Spirit of God is based on external things that we can visibly see that's primarily rooted in a giftedness, not in the fruit. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a pastor and a preacher and a leader who couldn't preach his way out of a wet paper bag that had a heart full of God because God can use that man and he's a whole lot safer too. Amen. Amen. Hey, look, folks, the fact of the matter is we all have gifts, but the fact that it is he wants us to look for fruit. Are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness. Oh, here's a big one. Self-control. Look for those. Look for those gifts. As a matter of fact, we say, well, I do look for those gifts. I, I do. We'll, we'll get up one morning and we'll open our Bible and we'll have a, a devotional time from Galatians 5.22. And, and we'll read this and we'll say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Hmm, that's good. I need more of that in my life. I, I want more of that in my life. Now, all of us have experienced wanting more of that in our life, right? I've looked at that. You look at that and think, man, I ain't got enough of that. And if I do think I got enough of that, my wife will come along and correct me. <laughs> so, so we need more of that. We know we need more of that. But here's the thing. Flesh is such a big part of our heritage. Flesh is such a big part of our DNA. Flesh is such a big part of our genetics. Flesh is such a big part of our culture. We are, listen, we are born into, surrounded by, raised up in, and modeled flesh more than spirit. Is that true? And so here's what happens. We'll come to something spiritual like this verse, and we'll say, okay, I want more of that in my life. Here's the deal. We are so trained up in flesh. Our default programming is flesh. Our primary frame of reference in life is so flesh that we'll take something spiritual like the fruits of the Spirit, and our first MO, our knee-jerk reaction, our initial attempt is always to attempt to produce those things by the power and the effort of the flesh. We get up one morning, we see that, we say, well, that's a whole lot of fruit, and I need more of them. Let's just take one at a time. Love. Okay, that's the first one, so I'm going to start with that today. I'm gonna, today's love day. And, man, I'm going to have love today. I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to have love, 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 love. I'm going to love them so much. I, I, may, I may get up this morning, and my wife is grumpy, but I'm going to love her anyway. One time the phone rang real early, and the guy answered the phone, and he said, Hello? His friend said, what's wrong with you? Did you wake up grumpy? He said, no, I let her sleep in. <laughs> I might wake up this morning, my wife's grumpy. I'm going to love her. My kids might not obey half asleep walking around late for school, but I'm going to love them anyway. And that morning you get up and your life goes, ha, 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 and your kids go, ha, 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 ha. And you look back and you shine your halo and you go, well, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> love goes out the window. And you think, well, let me go back to that verse again. <laughs> There's got to be something easier than love in there. Peace. Peace is next. Oh, okay, okay. Today's peace day. 
Man, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm telling you, we're going to have peace, peace, wonderful peace, peace that the world does not understand. They might, they might cut me off in traffic going to work. My boss might chew me out, threaten my job. But it doesn't matter. I will have peace. And you get out in traffic that morning, and you're, you're driving down the highway, and some idiot goes, Bleh! how about runs you off the road while he's drinking his biscuit and eating his tea and try, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and texting about runs you off the road, you roll your window down and you smile and you go, <laughs> peace. <laughs> a piece of your mind <laughs> is what you just gave them. So, man, you go back and you try harder and you try harder and you try it again. Let me tell you something, man. Listen, listen, listen. After about five days of that, you will give up. You say, this don't work. How do you know it don't work? Because I tried my best. Guess what? God don't want your best. You got into this whole situation. You got into this whole Christianity thing on a confession that you needed to die. Why in the world after we get into this thing, we got to convince God we got to live and help him out so we can get further down the road for Jesus. The fact of the matter is, it's a crucifixional life when you get in. It's a crucifixional life when you stay. He's not looking for what you can do. He's looking for what you'll let him do through you. Listen, here's the big liberating truth about the fruit of the Spirit that set me free. Here's the big liberating truth. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? Here's what that means. If that's true, and it is, then what that means is it's not the fruit of Scott. The fruit of the Spirit is it's his fruit, it's not my fruit. It's his fruit, not the pastor's fruit. It's his fruit, it's not your fruit. He wants to bear his fruit, not your fruit. Your fruit is weak. Your fruit is withered. Your fruit is circumstantial. Your fruit is short-lived. Your fruit is flesh-based. His fruit is faith-based. It's based on what he can produce through you, not what we produce for him. Listen, he identified who he was in the same passage where he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember that? In the same passage, he said, I am the vine, you are the... I am the vine, you are the... Now listen, last time I checked, a branch with fruit on it only has that fruit on it because it's tapped into the life of the vine, right? If you snap off the branch, that branch will dry up and the fruit that's on it will dry up with it. Why? Because the only life that the branch has is that which it draws from the vine. Now you snap off the branch, vine keeps growing, doesn't need the branch. Why? Because it's the vine. But Jesus identified him. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. What's your job? Work hard for me. That's not what he said. Try harder for me. That's not what he said. Your job is to abide, remain, rest in the life of the vine. Nowhere does the Bible ever command you to produce fruit. Not one time. You say, well, wait a minute, you were just talking about John 15. In that same passage, Jesus said, you abide in me, I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. Does that imply we should bear fruit? Yeah, but there's a difference between bearing fruit and producing fruit. He didn't command us to produce fruit. He commanded us to bear fruit. See, I'm the branch. I've got to understand my identity in him. He's the vine. I've got to understand his identity with me. So I'm the branch. I'm relying upon, dependent upon the life of the vine. My job is to rest in the vine, trust the vine, lean on the vine, abide in the vine, live in the vine, dependent upon the vine. His life flows through me and produces fruit. I get the joy of bearing the fruit his life produces. Amen? Does that make sense? Is this helping anybody? If it ain't helping you, it's helping me. I needed to hear this sermon. <laughs> Amen. Hey, look, the fact of the matter is, listen, it's his fruit that's liberating. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. He has no problem. He has no issues. He has no hang-ups. He has no deficiencies in being able to produce his own fruit. <laughs> You've never walked through an orange grove in Florida. You ever go to Florida to see those orange groves? And you go down there, and there'll be, could you imagine standing in the orange grove and listen to the orange trees straining to get the oranges out, grow those oranges? Is that, is that how it works? You ever walk through an apple orchard and Apples aren't quite there yet. <laughs> what was that? But you know what? You know what? <laughs> Describes most of our Christian lives. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
I was about to say something, but I'm not going to say it. Some of us need a Holy Ghost sex like so we can get on down the road for Jesus. Amen. I, I'm just saying. Hey, folks, the fact of the matter is, listen to me. He wants to produce his fruit in us. It is his fruit. He has no problem producing his own fruit. Hallelujah. I don't have to produce it for him. He wants me to take up a cross and die and be an empty vessel so he can produce his life through me. Last time I checked, he's better at loving people than I am. Amen. He's better at forgiving people than I am. He's a whole lot more patient than I am. He can be a better daddy than I can be. He can better be, be a better preacher than I can be. He can be a better husband than I can be. My job is not to do better for him. My job is to let him be his best through me. Amen. Folks, that's what he wants for you in your school. That's what he wants for you at your workplace. That's what he wants for you in your home, raising your babies and grandbabies, earning that wage, walking around the culture. He wants a, somebody who's empty of self so they can be full of him because he has an agenda that's better than yours and he can accomplish more than you. Amen. I know some people in my life I have a hard time loving. He has no problem loving. I know there are some people I have a hard time forgiving. He has no problem forgiving. And he wants to love them through me and forgive them through me and bless them from, through me and, 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 and overcome and, 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 and be generous and be gracious and be self-controlled all through me and you. It's the fruit of the Spirit. See, we have too much of a morality mentality, not enough of a spirituality mentality. There's a difference. Between morality and spirituality. Your pastor and I have had some good lunches together. And uh, the only thing that bothers me is he keeps eating off my plate. But anyway, I, I just... And you can tell. But anyway, I... We're just... We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're both of us have in our background some more legalistic rearings, I would say. True? And it was all about morality. It wasn't about spirituality. I mean, you know, I mean, some of the traditions we came out of, it's like, well, as long as you don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, or date girls that do, you're fine. <laughs> Essentially, that's, that was the message. And so we, we basically pass that on to our kids. We'll drop our kids off at a babysitter's house, and we'll say, now be good. <laughs> what we really mean is, don't be bad. <laughs> when we say be, be good, what we really mean is, you know, don't, don't break the lamp, don't throw your shoe through the television. Don't, don't tie the babysitter with duct tape to the chair like you did last time, right? That's what, when we say be good, we really mean don't be bad. And so we carry that language over and even into the church. And we say, well, got to be good, got to be good, got to be good. And what we're really telling ourselves is don't walk in the flesh, don't walk in the flesh, don't walk in the flesh. You can be moral and not be spiritual. You can raise good kids that are upstanding citizens and contribute to culture, but the fact of the matter is, don't know Jesus, and in all the morality, bust hell wide open without Christ. Am I telling the truth, Derek? So here, here's, what, here's, what I'm, here's my challenge in parenting. My challenge in parenting is to help my daughter fall helplessly, hopelessly in love with Jesus. My, my, daughter, my, my challenge in parenting is to help her walk in the Spirit and teach her what that means. My, my, my challenge in parenting is to model that. Not what daddy can do for God, but what, God, what daddy's letting God do through him. It, it, teaching her to fall in love with his word and learn to understand his word and be sensitive to the, to the promptings of the Holy Spirit living inside of her. Because here's what I found. If we'll teach our kids to be spiritual, morality will take care of itself. When they're in love with Jesus, modesty is not an issue. When they're in love with Jesus, illicit sexuality is not an issue. When they're in love with Jesus, the wrong kind of music is not an issue. When they're in love with Jesus, respecting authority is not an issue. When they're in love with Jesus, obeying parents is not an issue. When they're in love with Jesus, witnessing to their friends is not an issue. When they're in Jesus, there's so much more because God wants to turn you and me into a powerhouse for King Jesus. Not just somebody who didn't go to hell and looked a little bit more like heaven because they were moral, but because they literally let Jesus turn them into a vessel of holiness. Holy Spirit power. Spirit is opposed by the flesh, but the Spirit is also characterized by fruit. Whose fruit? His fruit. His love. His joy. His peace. His patience. His kindness. His goodness. His faithfulness. His gentleness. His self-control flowing. Flowing through us. Okay, Pastor. Okay, preacher, how, how, how do I tap in? The Spirit is opposed by the flesh. I understand that, that I can't overlap them and call the flesh spirit and the spirit flesh. I can't do that. I understand I got to walk in the Spirit. I understand I want to see His fruit. I'm going to be looking for His fruit. 
Whether or not I feel gifted, whether or not I feel like I've got a lot to bring to the table, it's all about his life through me, but how do I connect? How do I tap in to the power of the Spirit in my life? Verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, the first time I read that verse, I thought, now he's repeating himself. Why would he repeat himself? I thought living by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit are the same thing. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So I looked at another translation. There was another translation that said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And I thought, okay, there's a different word, in. Matter of fact, first time I went to Greek class, one of the first words we learned in Greek class in seminary was the word in. The, the Greek word in, the, the, the English word in comes from a Greek word that is uh, in. <laughs> That's true, it's E-N in Greek, and it's translated I-N in English. That was on, like, the first day. I poked my, the guy next to me. I'm like, man, this stuff is easy. <laughs> it went downhill from there. <laughs> the word in can be translated in, with, or by. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Okay, okay, that, that helps a little. I see that. I want you to look at the first word in verse 25. First word in verse 25. The little word if also can be translated since. Let's see if that helps us at all. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Mm. Since, statement of fact, unchangeable. We live by the Spirit. Let us also command, potentially changeable, dependent on choice, walk by the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, then let us also choose to walk in the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, how's that possible? How'd that happen? When did that start? When did you become alive by the Spirit? I told you last night we're saved instantly, we're saved progressively, and we're ultimately saved finally. We're saved instantly when our dead spirit becomes a live spirit. We're saved progressively as literally he, he conforms our soul to the image of his Son in our mind, will, and emotions, and we're saved finally when we get a new body. When you were made alive by the Spirit, it's because you had to be, because you were dead in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were dead in trespasses and sins, not sick, not asleep, not under anesthesia, not mildly numb. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We we're dead, and he made our dead spirit alive. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And so we're not only made alive, but we had to be kept alive because we're not in heaven yet. And we're, made, we're kept alive by the power of the Spirit of God perpetually in the same way there's perpetual gravity around the earth, in the same way that perpetually he holds all things together molecularly, in the same way there's a spiritual power keeping us alive. And it all began at a point in time when someone shared the gospel and by his grace and faith and favor we said, yes, by, how are you saved? By grace, through faith. Faith. What kind of faith were you saved by? Was it aged faith, vintage faith, 50-year faith? No, childlike faith. The Bible calls it mustard seed faith. You ever seen a mustard seed? Smaller than a mater seed. Yet it can move mountains. And even God gave you that measure of faith, Ephesians 2, so that you can't boast about any piece of the process. The grace is from him and the faith is from him. But mark it down, it was a complex faith, faith. The beautiful thing about the gospel is that even a five-year-old child can be saved by grace through faith. And what he's trying to tell us is the way we walk in the Spirit is the same way we were born in the Spirit. And the way we were born into the Spirit, kept alive by the Spirit, is the same way we walk in the Spirit, by faith. So number one, the Spirit is opposed by the flesh. Number two, the Spirit is characterized by fruit. Number three, the Spirit is engaged by faith. 
Matter of fact, this is all through Scripture. Have you heard Scriptures like this? Galatians 2.20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And we quoted that in Sunday school since we were knee-high to a grasshopper. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. But we don't quote the rest of the verse. He said, in the life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucial. Listen to this verse. Don't turn there. Just listen. Galatians 3.11. The righteous will live by. So there's no way to me to, for me to live a righteous life in the Spirit apart from faith. He presses further than that in Hebrews. Listen to this. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is highly unlikely you'll please God. Some laugh. Why? Because I misquoted it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does that mean? If I offer God something that is generated by flesh, even though it appears good on the surface, it's not acceptable. It's got to be generated by faith. Listen to this verse. Romans 14, 23. Everything, how much? Everything, how often? Everything. What's the measure? Everything that does not come from faith is sin. You know why I said everything? Because he meant everything. We think, here's what sin is. Sin is beating up your wife and neglecting your kids and lying on your income taxes and getting drunk on Saturday night. Friend, I'm telling you, listen to me. Sin is anything that does not come from faith. Anything, anything that doesn't come from faith. Anything that doesn't start with faith. Anything, even things attempted for God. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is you could start a huge ministry, have it on television, 10,000 people in the auditorium every week listening to you preach, write best-selling books that sell on the shelves of American and internationally, be on Larry King every other night, and be, have conferences around the country run by men who want to teach how to be, do ministry like you do ministry and preach like you preach and organize like you organize and lead like you lead because they want to have a church like yours. And the whole time men are applauding it, approving it, and appraising it, the whole time God can be looking it down on it with a stench in his nostrils and, a, and, a, and his stomach turning because he sees what man does not. When we applaud the gift and what we see externally, God may be looking at something we can't see that maybe that is generated and sustained by flesh, not faith. And anything that does not come from faith is counted as sin. So we have to ask the question, question am I singing in the choir by faith or by flesh? Am I teaching my class by faith or by flesh? Am I preaching sermons in the flesh or by faith? You say, well, nobody works as hard as I do. Are you doing it by flesh or by faith? Even those who want to get into heaven one day, and I quoted it Sunday morning, many are going to say to Jesus, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to say, that stuff don't count. Why does Jesus not even accept those things like miracles and casting out demons? Because even those things were generated, sustained, maintained by flesh, not faith. God doesn't want to see what man can do. God doesn't want to see what man's efforts can accomplish. God doesn't want to see how well we can program or organize. God wants to do what only he does through us. Amen. And that's by faith. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. How does that happen? It happens by faith. So a lot of us have tried the Christian life, and we've tried to live better, and we've tried to produce fruit, and it didn't work, so we gave up. And we say, well, apparently that was theory or something. I mean, it doesn't really work in the real world. Well, I hope at least the getting out of hell thing works. But as far as heaven and living for Jesus, I'm going to limp till I get there. I mean, really, that's almost how we live in our relationships and how we live in our trust and how we live in our meager attempts to try to do things for God. And friend, many times God wants to remind us that, look, it's not that Christianity's broken. It's that you're not. It's kind of like that guy who, who, who went to the store and bought a coffee maker. And he was going to replace his old Mr. Coffee coffee maker. And so he took his new Mr. Coffee coffee maker and he pulled it out of the box and took the styrofoam off, it, off of it and rinsed it out and he put it in there. And, and he'd had one before, so he, he knew what to do. He poured in the water and he put in the coffee in that upside down bonnet thing and, and put it all there. And, 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 and he, he put it in and there's a little button on the front that says brew. So he pushed that button and uh, nothing happened. Why we do this, but he did this. He pushed it again. 
I don't, I don't know why we do this, but he, he did this. He pushed it eight times real fast. As if it's going to change its mind. Didn't work. Now he's mad. He grabs a little pamphlet that always falls on the floor as soon as you open the box. He grabbed it and he dialed the number on the back. 1-800-MR-COFFEE. He's upset. He gets a rep on the phone. Listen, man, I've had Mr. Coffee coffee makers for years, and now you're making everything in China. The stuff don't half work no more. What happened to American quality? I want my money back. Man, he's mad. The rep calmly replies and said, Sir, I understand. I appreciate your call today. We want to help you in any way we can. Before you go to the expense of going back to the store and taking it back for your money back, can we just kind of walk through a checklist? I don't need a checklist. I've had these before. All right, can you just bear with me, sir? Just a little patience, please. Let's just, have you poured water in the back? Of course I poured water in the back. You've got to have water to make coffee. All right, did you put coffee, sir, in the basket of the fridge? Yes, I put coffee in the basket. You've got to have coffee to make coffee. Yes, sir. Uh, you got to make sure that, uh, that the button on the front, front is, yes, brew. I pushed it 182 times. <laughs> yes, sir, but it could be that it's actually working, but the carafe is not snug in place because if it's not snug in place, the button won't be pushed that lets the water come flow. I've done that. I've done that. I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. <laughs> yes, sir, I understand. I understand. I appreciate your patience with me, sir. Let me ask you a question. Is it plugged in? I got to go, click. <laughs> and, and, so, and so we came to revival, and, and we came to church, and we came to the Bible study, and we got this great big new gift called Christianity, relationship with God. We, we're saved now, and it's got a big red bow on it. It's fresh out of the box. It's awesome. And so we, we take it home, and we try to make it work, and, 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 and things go fine for a week or two, and then they crash and burn. And so we try harder, and we crash and burn, and we, we put more effort out, and we crash and burn, and we read books on Christian life strategy, and that doesn't seem to work. And after a while, we just throw it in the trash can and think, man, it don't work. Maybe it'll keep me out of hell, maybe. But as far as victory in the Christian life, that might be for the preacher. That might be for grandma who's been saved 50 years. But that don't work for me. I tried. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight is not that you got faulty equipment. You didn't. The problem is you're not plugged in to the power. Sometimes we don't want to be plugged into the power. There's too much dependence in that. And I don't know what that feels like. You know, the best Thirty dollars I ever spent at Walmart was on one of those Black and Decker cordless screwdrivers. You know what I'm talking about? Black and Decker cordless screwdriver. Man, those things are awesome. You've got one at your house. Man, they just they sit up there in the little charger in there in your utility room just all day, just sitting in there, just charging, <laughs> ready for use. Man, you get something in your house you want to fix and got to fix, you go get that thing and zzz, I mean, it's full. It's ready. Zzz, zzz. And son, you just, no cords, no wires. Zzz, zzz. Maybe 30, 40 minutes go by. Maybe 40 minutes. If it's a big project, what happens? Zzz. Do you whine and complain? No, you don't whine and complain. You just take it back to the base station, put it back in there, let it, a little while later, I'll be back. That is great. That is a great tool. That is great for Black & Decker. That's, that's a great product for Walmart to sell. I, I love my Black & Decker cordless screwdriver. And, and in my utilitarian life, absolutely, I need one of those. But I'm going to tell you something, man. God don't need those. God's not interested in cordless Christianity. But many times, that's the message that we've sent to him. That's what we want. Uh, I've run out of juice this week, so I'm going to go back down to the church. And boy, the, the worship better be cooking and the preaching better be hot. Because, brother, I'm drained out. You've got to pump me up, right? You've got to get me jacked up so I can go out, out, out full and live independently of the power source all week long. That's not what God intended. Friend, I don't know about you, but I need him as much on Monday as I need him on Sunday. Amen. I need him even more on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday too. Listen, Jesus Christ rigged this thing for his kind of intimacy with us and dependence that he did, we didn't just, wouldn't just go get plugged in for one day a week, but we'd be plugged in all week long. He's not into cordless Christianity. Are you plugged in to the power by faith? Are you tapped in by faith? You say, well, you know, I've been to a lot of churches in my life, and this is the most spirit-filled church I've ever been to, and that's why I'm here. 
And man, listen, praise God for that. And I think it's awesome. And I love the, the life in this church and the vitality. I've enjoyed the worship and the music and, and the fellowship. Y'all are so sweet and y'all have blessed me. Somebody even brought me cannoli tonight. I almost raptured prematurely. And God's doing a lot right here in this church. And I'm telling you, the best is yet to come. I believe that. But hear me and hear me well. Understand that just because you might be going to a spirit-filled church doesn't make you spirit-filled. Just because your pastor's full of God doesn't mean you're full of God. Just because your spouse is full of God doesn't mean you're full of God. Just because you were raised in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian, right? Just because you might be in a spirit-filled family doesn't make you spirit-filled. You don't get it through osmosis. You don't get it vicariously through, through somebody else. Uh, listen, we all have to make our own decision to walk in the Spirit, not walk in the flesh. You might be in the most fired-up church in Richmond, Virginia, but that won't do you any good if you don't decide to walk in the Spirit by faith yourself. Can you imagine a guy going out of here and he said, man, I'll tell you what, I won't, I won't go down to that bar. I'm going to get me a bottle of Jack Daniels and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stare at that bottle up till I get stone cold drunk. And so he goes in there and he orders a glass of Jack Daniels and they put it up there on the bar and here he is. Yeah. Yes, get a little buzz. Feeling a little woozy. Not because the alcohol, man, your leg's going to sleep, right? You're cutting off the circulation. Listen, you don't get drunk by a bottle of alcohol until what? Until you appropriate it. And you don't get filled with the Spirit of God by staring at Him working in somebody else's life. And don't go out of here saying, that preacher told us that we ought to go stare at a bottle of alcohol and get stone cold. Don't say that. I know what Baptists say. He did. He said it. He said we ought to go. <laughs> it's not till we appropriate. And so we've got to appropriate. How do, we, how do we appropriate? He tells us in the text how to appropriate. Matter of fact, here's what the Bible says about wine. Do not be drunk with wine. Isn't that what it says? Matter of fact, isn't it interesting that in the same verse where he says, do not be drunk with wine, he also says, be filled with the... In other words, instead of being under the domination, of, under the control of a substance called alcohol, be under the, do, under the domination of, the influence of, the leadership of the Holy Spirit instead. He tells us how to appropriate it. In verse... Uh, 25, he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk. Now, what, is, what does walk mean? Walk means, and here's a huge seminary definition, so I might have to say it a few times before you get it. Walk means to put one foot in front of the other in a forward motion. How many, how many of y'all know we are sheep? We are sheep, right? You know what the Bible says? God, God used sheep to illustrate people. He's a shepherd, we're sheep. You know why he used sheep as an illustration? Because we is the dumbest people on the planet. We need it simple. And here's what he said, listen, walk. You know what walking is? It's walking. comes from the world of the military, that word. It means to keep cadence. That's what the word means. Cadence. You familiar? Maybe this will jar your memory. Hip, 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 right, hip. You ever heard that? Right? You, you got a picture in your mind when I started that, didn't you? Hip, 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 right, hip. I don't know, but I, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I, I'm just... I'm just, I'm just saying that, that, there's, that there's a cadence in the military, and you've seen it. It's this picture of the drill sergeant out front and this platoon finally formed behind him. Now, at first, they're a little awkward. They just started boot camp. But by the end, they are one uniform machine, and, and, and they're in lockstep with the drill sergeant. They are walking. That is the word. They are keeping cadence with he takes a step, they take a step. He takes a step, they take a step. He turns left, they turn left. He turns right, they turn right. He stops, they stop. That's cadence. 
They don't go ahead. They don't go far behind. They're in step with. That's the word, in step with the Spirit. How in the world do you live by the Spirit? How in the world are you filled by the Spirit? How in the world do you walk in the Spirit? Here's how you do it. Step by step by step. He didn't say run in the Spirit. He said walk. He didn't say crawl in the Spirit. He said walk. He said walk in the Spirit. Here's what our problem is. We don't want to walk in the Spirit. We're a microwave society. We'll put instant coffee in the microwave and say hurry up. I ain't got all second. I want the whole plan right now. God, I want the five-year plan. Guess what? Sometimes God don't give you a five-year plan. He didn't do it. He wants us helplessly, hopelessly, lovingly, eagerly, dependent, listening, yielded, step by step by step. By step. You know why he doesn't give us a five-year plan sometime? No, listen, you ought to set goals. Those are good. But hold them loosely. God might take a left when you thought you were going to take a right. God might take a right when you thought you were going to take a left. Do you know why God doesn't give us a five-year plan? Because we're so full of flesh, we'd say, thanks, God. See you in five years. And God is looking for a people who will be in step with him, listening with him, walking with him, yielded to him step by step by step by step in step when we're choosing a TV show to watch, in step when we're bringing an issue to the floor, in step when we're choosing a college to attend, in step when we're choosing a career to change, in step when we determine how to steward our money, in step when we're deciding whether to move or not, in step about who we're going to marry, in step about who we're going to spend our time, in step how we're going to schedule our day, in step the first hour of the day, in step everything till noontime, in step all through the afternoon, in step as we go to bed at night, in step when we're working, in step when we're playing, in step when we're praying, in step when we're dreaming, in step when we're planning, in step when we're sleeping, in step by step by step. How do you live the victorious Christian life? Here's how you do it. Step by step. Just step by step. Step by step, by step, by faith. And you know what? He's willing and able and ready and capable of leading you, listen, step by step. He's there every step. He's with you every step. He's got something to say every step. And if you don't hear him say something at this step, just keep doing the thing you heard him say at the last step. It's called the Jesus two-step. That's pretty good. I ought to write that down. <laughs> See, there's, that's what sets Christianity apart from every religion on the planet. Man, I, I've been to so many churches so many times, I lose track sometimes of even where I'm at. <laughs> I mean, golly, I'm just glad to be in Lake City, Florida tonight at all. So anyway... Where's the beach? And I... I I'll go to the pastor, you know, I'll go to church sometime. I've never been there. John Marks was pastor here the first time I came. We parked our motorhome out back at the little house back there. I get the question. Scott, is there anything you need while you're here? Well, I just started answering that question the same way. Where's Walmart? I don't need to go right now. I'm just saying, you know, if, if I need something, because there's always a Walmart. And, and so, and so I have different pastors would answer that question a different way. They would, there, there's always the pastor who, who stands there beside your vehicle as you're, as you're maybe ready to go, and he's going to give you directions. And he writes them all down. He starts drawing lines. This is the pike. These are the roads coming off the pike. This is a red light. This is Jethro's barn. I'm thinking Jethro's barn is smaller than the red light. I don't understand. This is not to scale. You know, so I'm driving to Walmart, and I'm going, man, did I miss a line? And what is that? And I can't even read. Should have been a doctor. I can't read his writing. Then there's that pastor that'll bless your heart. He said, I'll tell you what, hop in the car. I'll get in the passenger seat, and I'll show you how to get there. Thank you. A little better. Hey, but you know what the biggest blessing is of all? Hop in the car with me, give me the wheel, and I will take you there myself. You understand, that's what sets Christianity apart from every religion on the planet. Every religion on the planet says, you want to know how to get to heaven? You want to know how to get to God? Here's a road map. You can't read it. It contradicts itself. It doesn't make sense. 
Hope you make it. Doubt your will. That's every religion. Christianity not only gives you the Bible as a roadmap, he says, listen, if you let me inside your heart, I will take the wheel and I will take you there myself. Amen. Friend, nobody can say that. He wants to take you there himself by his strength, by his wisdom, by his guidance, by his navigation, by his power. But yet still step by step. You know how you're going to repair your marriage? You're going to let him do it step by step. You know how you're going to choose who you're going to marry? You're going to let him do it through you step by step. Not crawling behind, not running ahead of God. Step by step. You know how you're going to choose that ministry? You know how you're going to make a difference and an impact in the culture so hell backs up and the gospel is advanced and God is glorified? You know how you're going to do it? Step by step. I will not be able to stand before God and say, Jesus was Lord of my life if he wasn't Lord of my years. Why? Because my life is the sum of my years. I won't be able to stand and say, Jesus was Lord of my year if he wasn't Lord of these months that make up this year. I won't be able to say, Jesus was Lord of this month if he wasn't Lord of my weeks. I won't be able to say, he was in charge, I was listening, yielded this week if he wasn't Lord, if I wasn't listening, if I wasn't yielded this month day because my week is nothing more than the sum of my days and my day is nothing more than the sum of my hours and we could say moments by moment by moment listen step by step by step how do you live a life pleasing and glorifying to God step by step spirit is opposed by the flesh yes it is a battle it is a war but it is not one that we must lose there's victory in Jesus when we walk in the Spirit, he's characterized by fruit. Not our fruit, his fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. His love, his joy, his peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. His character being birthed in and through us and by faith. Be filled, be fruitful by faith. Childlike, simple faith. Step by step. Let's stand together tonight all over this building. Can we do that right now? Let's stand Years ago, I heard this story about a, <clears throat> a chess champion. I mean, he was winning chess meet after chess meet. He was good. He would tour nations. He was playing the best in the world. He was also a collector and connoisseur of art. So he made it his habit that when he went into a town to play a chess game against some opponent or set of opponents, he would always take in a few art museums. He had seen some of the finest in the world. He was in one particular town in Europe where he was having a chess meet that night, that night or afternoon. And that morning he stopped by, stopped by the, the museum there and he began to eyeball certain pieces of art. One particular painting caught his eye because it was a picture of a chess game. The picture was something like this. There was a chess board lined out. Many of the pieces were off the table. The game was well advanced. At one end of the table sat a man, a human being. He looked like you, looked like me, average man. But it was clear he was in great emotional distress. His face was drawn. His shoulders were hunched. Large tears were painted coming down his face. And his opponent, with one glance, it explained it all. Across the chess board was, sitting at the other side of the table was his opponent, a face we'd all recognize. Dark red skin, very cartoon-like, horns on his head, a little goatee, a pointy tail. A pitchfork lay in the corner. It was clear who his opponent was. And the words, ha, ha, were coming, drawn, painted, coming out of his mouth. And the title of the painting said it all checkmate question mark something wasn't right now to any passerby they would see the scene this man was defeated it was too late game over there was a clue in that question mark and this man being a master of the game stopped and he began to 
survey that painting. He called for a curator. He said, sir, is there a chess board in the building? He said, yes, I'll bring you one. He brought one. He set it on a table just beneath the painting. He outlined the pieces on the board exactly as it was in the painting. And for two hours nearly, he stood there and he would look up at the painting, down at the board, move a man, move him back. Up at the painting, down at the board, move a man, move him back. He'd look again, stare a while, move a man, move him back for two hours. Finally, he laid down one piece and smiled. He said, now understand. He said, now I understand, but you don't, sir. And he began to speak to the man in the painting. He said, sir, I know your plight. I know it well. I've been in your many times myself. I've won games and I've lost, so I win more now. I'll never forget the sting of losing. And I know it seems that your game is the most important game of all because of the size of your opponent. He said, sir, but surveying your situation, I have seen something that apparently you have not. And while the title of the painting says it all and it seems to be over, the question mark betrays that it is not. And I've seen something, sir, that apparently you've not seen, and that is this. There is yet one more move yet to be made. And the good news is, sir, you get to make it. Some of you felt like that man walking in this revival this week. There's some areas in your life where you felt like the devil had the last laugh. And when he, he detected you were going to go to church and you came in this place, some of you actually felt shame walking in the building. And you've sat here at different times of the week and you felt, you know what, I can't believe I'm even here. I shouldn't be here. God knows, man, if the people around me knew what's going on in my life, they wouldn't even want to sit by me. I cannot believe that. Boy, I'm glad that preacher doesn't know what I'm going through because he might name it out loud. Man, I'm telling you, it's crazy. I, I don't even know if I ought to be here. Man, there's all kinds of stuff we carry. Or we thought, you know what, maybe I'll get motivated enough that I'll try harder again. And then there's this voice in your head that said, go ahead, try it. It won't work. It never did before, and it ain't going to work this time. You're just going to leak, no matter how full you get. And the news that God wants to give you tonight, the news he has from his word for you and for me, is that there's one more move that you get to make. The devil can't take it. He has no counter move for it. And you don't just get to make it once. You get to make it again and again and again and again. It's called walk in the Spirit. He can handle your arguments. He's smarter than you. He can handle your intellect. He's wiser than you. He can handle your speed. He's faster than you. The thing Satan can't handle is the Spirit of the living God in you. Amen. Walk in the Spirit. And so that's the prayer tonight. There have been many things laid on this altar. Just about every night the altar's been full and people have said, Lord, I'm tired of this. I want to lay it at your feet and I'm struggling here and here's my struggle. And Lord, I need more grace. Give me your grace. I need more power. Give me your power. I'm laying this down. I'm laying that down. I'm laying this down. I'm laying that down. And praise God for that. But the call tonight, the call tonight is primarily, Lord Jesus, I want to walk in the Spirit by faith. Bear your fruit in me. I'm tired of trying to produce love. I want you to love through me. I'm tired of trying to produce patience. I want you to be patient through me. I'm tired of trying to make self-control happen. I want you to be self-controlled through me. Lord, I want your fruit, not mine. I want your life, not mine. I want your power, not mine. I'm a vessel. Fill me, Jesus. And patch those leaks by faith. And then you get up, and then what do you do? Well, you just wait till the next revival. No. Start taking steps. Step by step. That's how you do it, guys. It, it's no different for the preacher. It's no different for me. It's no different for you or the guy that's been saved today, step by step. Father, we love you. You have rigged this thing for victory. It's not broken. And you have called the people by your name. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You have set us apart to send us out into the culture, in the world, not of the world, to be a light to the world so that we can show the world that Jesus is and Jesus reigns and Jesus loves. And Lord, that's only possible by your Spirit. Lord, we are in desperate days. We are sowing the seeds of destruction. But Lord, you have the opportunity to turn that around by us and through us. Lord, I pray you'd find the people here tonight who, do, who don't care what people think. Find us here tonight who don't care about staying comfortable. Find the people here tonight who, doesn't, who don't want to maintain the status quo. Find the people here tonight that want to see you do through us whatever it takes to make us all you intended us to be for your namesake and for our good. We love you and praise you. Hear us tonight, I pray.
in Jesus name would you come and join me right now as these guys lead us in worship and right now if God has put that on your heart to pray that that Lord by faith I want to bear your fruit would you come right now just begin to step out Lord by faith I want to bear your fruit step by step in my life is that your prayer is that your heart tonight guys lead us in worship would you and as we all sing together this altar is open Let me break in right here because what we just sang is not the experience for some here tonight. There's some of you have, who've not been washed white as snow. There's some of you who have not experienced that cleansing. We all know we're sinners. We are sinners. We're apart from God. There's a chasm between us and God we cannot cross. God has made a provision called Jesus. His blood, His cross, His sacrifice covers our sins. But only for those who believe, only to those who believe gave He the right to become the sons of God. That's what the Bible says. To become the children of God. We are born children of the devil. The only way we become children of God is by the grace and the truth, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you trusting in to take you to heaven? What are you trusting in to give you access to God right here and right now? Is it church membership? That won't work. Is it baptism? That doesn't save you. Is it good works? That'll fail every time. Our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. That's what the Bible says in, a, in terms of earning or meriting anything of God. So he offers his son as a free gift. Jesus Christ bled and died and he said, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved other than Jesus. He's the only name. He's the only one. Have you ever received Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask these guys to lead us in another line of that song. And as they do, this altar is open. Our pastor's here. If I know anything about your pastor, Pat loves people and he loves to see people come to Christ. He loves God. He loves his word. And you're coming to a safe man when you come to say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. He will humbly and openly lead you to Christ. And you can walk out of here tonight knowing that you'd go to heaven if you died, knowing that you have access to God through Jesus, knowing that he belongs to you and you belong to him. Would you come tonight and let him know? If you still need to pray, you're a believer, you want to lay some things on the altar or take some things up, do that tonight. Don't spare, don't hesitate. Let's sing, guys. Lead us in that song. And as you sing, this altar's open. In when before the throne Yes. I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save 
That sums up our revival. He paid it all. We owe him everything. I stand in him complete. He died. He died for our our sins. To save my lips, I still repeat. For Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. All to him I owe. Sin had left a stain. Had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, white as snow. White as snow. White as snow. Scott's going to come back up and say a quick word in just a moment. Uh, I, feel, I feel led to say this, though. You know, we're told don't be drunk with wine. Don't let any controlling influence in your life dictate how you feel, what you do. Don't, don't, get a, don't give in to addictive stuff, chemicals, things, images, influences that will take control of your life. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that these last two messages were perfect. I mean, just perfect for this church. You know, we prayed for our leaders tonight. And thank you for praying for them. Prayed for our country tonight. Prayed for our church. Um, But the last thing we really need is to leave this place tonight thinking, boy, if I just try a little harder, you know, if I could just make another commitment, if I could just try, you know, it's been clearly preached tonight, that we need to be spirit-led as a church and as individuals as believers, as husbands and spouses, wives, kids, teenagers. And what could God do? Imagine what God could do with, with a, a church and with churches, with people who instead of, oh, one more day at the whatever your thing is in the church, instead of trying a little harder at that job or whatever it may be in, in your ministry or even in your daily life, trying real hard to help people or whatever. And what, if we, what if we really were filled with, controlled by, dominated by, and we, Christians are indwelt permanently with the Holy Spirit. You're not going to lose Him, but we're to be filled in the sense of being filled up like a balloon or being more like being filled up like a, 
a hand in a glove than we do leak. What a great illustration that is. So I pray that we would leave this revival filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, motivated by the Holy Spirit, and come back tomorrow night, and come back Sunday, and do whatever you're going to do, as has been so clearly taught tonight, that way, through the influence of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do an offering in just a minute for Scott uh, Newton Smith Ministries. And um, in fact, ushers, you can come up while they're coming. Scott, come and uh, share a little bit more. My last chance to do this before I leave tomorrow, and I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, for being here every night. How many of you have been here every single night? Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Would you give yourselves a hand for that? Amen. This has been a tremendous... See, there's a lot of people saying today, listen carefully, a lot of people say today, um, revivals don't work. And so there are fewer revivals. Have you noticed there are fewer revivals being held today? We've got tons of churches, tons of church plants, fewer revivals. And uh, you've proved this week revivals work. Revivals work. Matter of fact, I, one stat that I've been sharing with a lot of people is uh, churches that ho hold revivals baptize 27% more than those who don't. It says not just something about what you wanted to do in a few days. It says something about your overall desire to make an impact, to make a difference on your community and reach people for Christ. And that's really what, at the end of the day, what this is all about for the glory of God, of course. So I want to say thank you. You've been incredibly faithful to attend this week, and it's been a blessing. But I want to say a personal blessing to you, and I want to say this in front of you. Your pastor is a blessing. Pat is a blessing. He's a blessing to me. And I know he's a blessing to you. Now, 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 now here's the thing. We don't all agree on everything. And, uh, you know, Pat had, if, we, if we'd have had one more lunch together, we'd have gotten a fight, probably, actually. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you know, we, we express ideas and we bounce things off each other nobody's going to agree all the time, but I'll tell you one thing. I know his heart's in the right place, and he wants to glorify God and see people saved, and he loves you. I, I can't count, I can't count on one finger how many times he said he loves his church. No. <laughs> I can't count on all my fingers and toes, truthfully, how many times he said he loves you. He loves his church. He loves his church. You say, sometimes I wonder... That's okay. He loves you. And I think you know he does. Would you pray for him? He's your under-shepherd. God brought him here a long time ago. And, uh, and uh, he looks pretty good for 49, I think. And I, <laughs> him and, and Elizabeth and the kids, I, I know this. As the under-shepherd, here's Satan's M.O. Here's Satan's M.O. always. Smite the shepherd to scatter the sheep. Smite the shepherd to scatter the sheep. And I've never met a pastor who was not under attack virtually all the time. Because Satan wants to attack the church, and he wants to do it by attacking the pastor. So would you pray for him, bless him, bring him taters and maters, send him cards, <laughs> hug his neck, bless his family, babysit his kids so they can have date nights, do all that stuff to bless him. I've never met a, a church that God didn't bless if they blessed their pastor. And so I want you to do that. I want to say thank you for your love offerings for our ministry. Our ministry is a 501c3 corporation. It's governed by a board of directors who oversee the accounting of all our funds so that we can do ministry in a highly accountable way and continue to do ministry, not just here, but around the world at multiple levels. And so I want to say thank you for investing, not just loving on what I, you know, for me, do this week, but even investing in us as we go out of here. And I just want to say thank you for that from us and my wife and our board. And uh, we appreciate you so much. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Thank you. Um, we're going to thank you for everything. And thank you, Scott, for being with us. We really appreciate you. You know, I sense tonight there's folks that could really use someone to talk to, someone to pray with, that maybe have a need in your life. Uh, don't go that way. Come this way and come talk to me. Come talk to my wife. Come talk to one of our deacons, someone who can pray with you. And if you want to give your heart to Jesus tonight, do it. Don't put it off. Come forward. Talk to somebody. If you have a burden, something, something that's really bothering you and you just need someone to talk with and pray with, we're here to do that with you. And we'll do that with you uh, just in a moment once we dismiss. And um, it's so good to see the different generations here tonight. So it's just so good to see the young and the old and, and everybody in between. And I'm, I'm extremely burdened about the future of our church, the future of our country. And to see all these teenagers out here tonight, man, that just blesses my heart a lot. And uh, love you guys. When I came to this church 13 years ago, there was a little kid that moved into the youth group named Sean, and good night. He's grown up, and 
and Josh, man, these guys, it's just awesome to see them using their, their talents to serve the Lord. One of them um, that, I, that, that I love more than all the rest of them, he can't play anything, but, um, but he's still at my church, and that's Justin. And um, young, young man who's bringing up a godly family. And Justin, if you don't mind, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I am. Um, I'd like to ask you to stand and just pray for this offering. Pray for Scott. And uh, if you would offer a, a, a prayer for us. Can you do, are you okay with that? Okay. And um, pray for our offering and, uh, and then we'll sing a song and go home. Stand sing with us. Though the earth cried out for blood, satisfied her hunger was. The pillars come down, raging seas, the souls of men she craved. My sun and moon from balcony turned their head in disbelief. Their precious love would taste the sting, disfigured and on Friday thief, on Sunday a king, laid down in grief, woke with the keys, dead on that day, first born of the slain, the man Jesus Christ lay that we come to get charged up, but may we continually stay plugged into you, God. We love and praise you, God. You guys are dismissed. You can continue to stay and sing with us or worship as you leave. So three days in darkness left the morning sun to shame the throes of death is over